Welcome to We Need to Talk Now, presented by at and I'm Alicia J here with Ashley Nicole Moss. And listen, the news is flying in from everywhere. <laughs> I, it's like we can't even keep up, but we're really excited to talk with you all about the world of sports and women's sports right here on We Need to Talk Now. But first, as always, we have to do a little bit of housekeeping and remind you all to like, share, subscribe. All the information is down below. All the We Need to Talk handles to your left. Well, that's your left. There we go. And all of our individual handles right below Alicia there. And also we have a QR code that makes it so easy for you to find us wherever you get your favorite podcast right there. So whether it's Spotify, Apple, and also make sure you keep those YouTube notifications all the way up because we are just getting started on We Need to Talk Now and you don't want to miss a thing. Definitely just getting started. And if you just want to listen, right, YouTube is great. We love to see you there. But if you just want to listen, head on over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere where you listen to your favorite podcasts, and we're going to be right there as well. So Ashley, let's just get into it. There are so many things that are going on right now. And one is that it's the Emma Hayes era, okay? Um, The first uh, US WNT roster dropped today under Emma Hayes. And there are a lot of people on there. It's stacked. It's definitely yeah. stacked. And there are some notable people that aren't on there that, you know, people are kind of talking about online. Um, goalkeeper Alyssa Nair is not on there. Mm-hmm. You know, she is injured, which, you know, is obviously a concern for being on a roster of this magnitude. But, you know, they're saying that if she's healthy, she will be a lock. So that's really good to know. The final roster drop before the Olympics roster is named. So the timing of it definitely is a big deal as well for people who are unaware. Yeah, definitely a big deal. This is not the final one by any means. Um, So people are saying, you know, obviously she still has a chance to make it, but she's not on there currently. Um, Also, Hal Hirschfeld and Sam Staub, they both made it. And this is their first time that they've had national team call-ups, which is really awesome. Um, Hirschfeld, you know, like... They're saying that her stability as a defensive midfielder um, is definitely something that they they want. Um, they're saying that it's a good pick for that. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I would like to say that really just threw me for a loop is that Lynn Williams is not on the roster at all. And we're going to be talking about um, an am- amazing thing that she did a little later on in the show. But um, she's having an amazing season. She's had an amazing impact on the national team before and to not see her name on there is definitely having a lot of people saying like, what is going on? So that was a big question for people after that initial roster dropped. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned midfielder Crystal Dunn, who is a midfielder for her club team, but has been a defender on the national team for a very long time. And she's been outspoken about wanting uh, to be in a midfield role with the national team was actually listed as a forward on this roster and it came as a complete surprise um especially because it was emma hayes who played dunn as a defender um at chelsea so a lot of surprises going on with this roster in a multitude of different ways um but it's exciting you know seeing how hayes is willing to play around um with it for a little bit but even though the u.s women's national team is a incredibly stacked um, at the forward position, it is definitely going to be interesting. I'm always excited to see what that final roster looks like. As you mentioned, this is not the final roster, so I want to make that very, very clear. But this is, like I said, the final roster before the final roster drop, rather, before the Olympic roster is named. So there's an element of surprise. People always try to guess, you know, who's going to be on, who's not going to be on based on this final roster drop. But again, going to go ahead and put it out there. We don't know. We're not predicting. We are just sharing the news. So don't come for us if certain names are missing from the roster. We had no say in the matter. Yeah, we definitely had no say. But what I will (laughs) say, you mentioned that it's stacked. It's going to be so hard to narrow it down to that final list. Um, A lot of decisions to be made. And there's some other names that are on here that are on the injury inclusions list. Um, So Alex Morgan is on there. And a Mm -hmm. lot of people are saying that maybe she shouldn't be, you know? Um, but again, just the, it's the, it's the inclusion, the injured inclusions list. So it's not necessarily that you're on the team, but you're included. 
Um, and Jaden Shaw is also on that list. But again, a whole bunch of stack names, a whole bunch of talent on that roster. It's going to be really hard to pick that. And so it'll be really, really interesting to see what that final list is as we go into the Olympics. Yeah, definitely. We'll keep our eye on that for sure. But from the field to the arena, the WNBA should actually have a D in its name because the D stands for drama because there's never a shortage of drama in this league. Let's Ooh. start with the positive side of things first. Caitlin Clark just continues to do big things in the W her rookie year. Big sponsorship deal for her was named earlier today, I believe. She has announced her partnership with Wilson. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar, Wilson makes a bunch of different uh, sporting goods. I believe they also make apparel as well. But mm -hmm. specifically, we're talking about the basketball Kaylin Clark is set to become the first athlete to have a signature collection with the brand since Michael Jordan in the 1980s. That's now, huge. Which is huge. Like, I'm thinking about this not just from the side of women's basketball, but men's basketball as well. Thinking of all the names that have come and gone in this league, the names that still remain, it's actually mind blowing that since Michael Jordan, there has not been until Kaylin Clark recently an athlete with their signature with a signature collection to their name it's at, like i had to take i had to take a double check or a double look multiple times um at that stat because i was like that can't be right but it is 1980s which is a big deal i mean what do you make of this news it all, it almost seems impossible that it's been that it's long to be honest right? with you. Like, what? yeah no but it's just another you know Obviously, it's Caitlin Clark, and we can say that, but it's also another big win for women's sports. You know, mm -hmm. in women's basketball, it's a huge win um, in and around that it's Caitlin Clark, you know, just bringing more sponsorship dollars in. Yeah, I mean, I saw um, a mock-up of, like, what the potential ball could look like, and it looks like it has, like, her silhouette, like, her image in the basketball. It's a gold basketball with, like, black trimming and things like that. So it looks really cool. One thing I'm excited about, you know, this partnership, this collaboration, if you will, um, it's going to put the basketball in the hands of so many young girls who are going to see this image on the ball and think she can do it. I can do it. And that's no knock to Michael Jordan, his legacy, obviously Jordan, no. the goat for a reason, but I think it's just different when you see a reflection of yourself in some way, shape or form, whether it's because she's, you know, a woman like you, or she comes from the same areas you come, or she looks like you. It just putting that basketball in the hands of so many young girls is just going to remind them if they didn't already know that girls can play sports too, and they can be, you know, pretty damn good at it. So I'm very excited excited for this this sponsorship deal it's a it's a big deal on uh, many different levels absolutely i mean anytime uh, you can get that representation it's huge yeah well listen on the other side of the w there is the drama that i was alluding to when i first opened this conversation now in what kind of was an unprecedented you know move by the city of las vegas the las vegas convention and visitors authority so they're really for people who aren't familiar they're very much in charge of like tourism and making vegas cool and exciting to visit and really just bringing in revenue from that angle you know not so much the real estate and things like that but bringing people to vegas for a multitude of different reasons whether it's sporting events whether it's you know vacations whatever the case may be they made a big splash when they announced they were providing a hundred thousand dollars annual sponsorship to each Aces player for this season and the next season. So an unprecedented move. They were giving sponsorship money to not just the team, but to the individual players. That's a big deal. Now, the LVCVA, which is the short version of the long thing I just said, negotiated this deal directly with the players' representation. So that's their agencies, their managers, whoever's kind of in charge of, you know, their whole entities that was negotiated with them directly. Um, the organization was uninvolved. So the Aces as a team were uninvolved with this move. Again, it came from the individual representation of the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Aid Authority and the associations in which these players are with, right? Now, the league is still investigating this because per the WNBA's collective bargaining agreement, quote, sponsor, business partner, or third party pays or agrees to pay compensation for basketball services even if such compensation is designated as being for non-basketball services to a player under contract to the team. 
So basically, in layman's term, because it's a lot of legal mumbo jumbo, yeah. the WNBA is saying that you can't go ahead and sponsor a individuals on the same team from the city in which that they play because it's an unfair advantage basically to the rest of the league who may not be in major markets, may not be in markets that are able to go ahead and do those things for them as well. This is interesting for a multitude of reasons. That's my word of the day, multitude. So if I use it a lot, it's because it was literally on my dictionary app to use it a few times today. Um, because we keep talking about growing this league and expanding the business of this league and investing in women's sports and investing in these women. And that's exactly what was done here. Now, on the flip side of the conversation, I can understand why the league has to investigate this because, for example, and obviously this is not the perfect example because now that Caitlin Clark's there, it's not so much of a small market anymore. It's a different lens on this team. But Indiana and Vegas are two drastically different cities. They have a drastically different tourism. They have drastically different activities to do. There's a different interest in those two cities. So yes, there is a little bit of unfairness that if you're in a smaller market, you can't possibly get these kind of deals because the city in which you play can't provide or won't provide these kind of deals. But on the other side of that, like I said, we keep talking about growing the game and investing in women's sports. And this is exactly just that. So I'm curious, where do you lie in this argument? Well, the key word here is sponsorship. Right. Okay? Sponsorship and marketing have both catapulted this league in ways that nothing else has. You know, I mean, obviously, besides the play of the actual players that is stellar and is putting, you know, the WNBA on the map. Getting the players out there with marketing and sponsorship has really, really cemented a lot of the players in this league and propelled the league in a lot of different ways. So right. when you hear the word sponsorship, and that is exactly what they did. They went and they did a actual sponsorship with each one of these players and their agents, not the mm -hmm. team. Anybody can come and do a sponsorship like this with somebody. It doesn't have to be the city that they live in. It could be, for example, Wilson just did a sponsorship and a whole deal with Caitlin Clark. Wilson could go in, I'm, I'm just using them as an example, could go in and make the same deal with players on a team and do a sponsorship deal. So my thing is, instead of saying we're going to investigate this and make sure that it's fair and all of this, you should be applauding that somebody wants to invest in the game Somebody wants to invest in these players and invite others to do the same on other teams. If you don't think that that national coverage of what they did sparked somebody in their marketing room and in their offices to say, we should be doing the same thing too. Like, mm -hmm. I know that there will be people lining up to do something like this to help all the players on a team out, you know, no matter if it's the city or somebody else. So for me, a sponsorship is a sponsorship. If somebody wants to give somebody money to change their, think about the rookies and the contracts that they have and how $100,000 will go a long ways because a lot of these other sponsorships are not coming from, they're coming to the top two players on the team or the top three players on the team, but they're not coming to the whole team. So think about how this changes, you know, the income potential for these players and what a lot of things that it can alleviate in that process that the league hasn't ne necessarily alleviated. So my, it, to me, you know, announcing that you're going to do an investigation mid game, I think is what they did when the aces, I think the aces were playing or they had just finished playing and they found out that they were being investigated. That is a really strong word to have when you know, one of the things that we've been wanting for women's sports and wanting for women is sponsorships. Like, find that out first before you start saying that you're going to investigate. And if somebody's got around the whole, like, not really paying the players what they should have, you know, what they deserve, or mm -hmm. maybe not even gotten around, but just said, like, we want them to be successful, you know, on and off the court, right? Um, so we're going to find a way to sponsor each one of these women and give them more money to help them out. Mm -hmm. Applaud it. <laughs> you know, it, it might make you look bad in a moment, but at the same time, it's it's one of the things that we have been wanting for women's sports for years is money and sponsorships. There's the quote from the Las Vegas Authority president and the 
quote goes, quote, we did this the right way. We have 100 influencers we, influencers we pay to represent Las Vegas. This isn't any different than that. All of these ladies are completely eligible to have sponsorships. We are just asking to represent Vegas. So in that regard, I, I completely agree with you. I think that if I'm playing devil's advocate, because that's what we do on this pod, we have the tough conversations. I think that people are looking at it not so much from the sponsorship itself, but who provided the sponsorship. So like I started off by saying, the Las Vegas, I'm going to get this name correctly, the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority is directly tied to tourism. So because Vegas is such a hot spot for tourism, tourism across the board, whether it's shows, whether it's sports, whether it's gambling, whether it's vacation, they have the funds to go ahead and provide the sponsorship, which again, is completely legal. There's nothing against sponsorships. People, I believe, and I think the league is looking at it from a different perspective and saying, okay, the sponsorship may be legal, but there may be an unfair advantage when there are tourism organizations within certain cities that can provide their home teams with sponsorship because they are so much more lucrative than, say, a smaller market like Indiana or, you know, like there's no sports team here or Kansas, just the first team I can think of. You know, a New York and L.A., a Miami, a Vegas can go ahead and provide a different level of sponsorships. And from that perspective, we have to figure out a way to make it fair. But again, you shouldn't go ahead and be penalized for the city that you play in. You don't have any choice where you get drafted. It's not like the Aces, you know, constructed this super team overnight. They grew, they grew this team from the ground up. It just so happens that they play in Vegas, a city that is now very much a tourism hub because Vegas wasn't always a hot spot. It kind of died down for a little bit. And now it's getting, you know, it's revival with all the, you know, motion and things that are happening in the city. So I'm 50-50. I can understand the frustration maybe or understand rather not the frustration why the league has to investigate. But I also don't think that players and teams, but in this conversation, players, because the team's not involved, should be penalized for the cities that they play in when they don't, for the most part, have a say in what city that they're drafted to. And this just so happens to be a team that's in a lucrative city, but that's not something that they should be penalized for, you know, if that makes sense. It does to me and it doesn't because, yes, this was the Las Vegas tourism and I'm I'm getting it completely wrong, but it was the city of Las Vegas that came forward and did this. Mm -hmm. But anybody could have really honestly come forward and done this. We've seen this in college, as a matter of fact. Yeah. People have come through and said, hey, everybody gets a truck, you know, mm -hmm. everybody gets this, everybody gets yeah. that. And and so this may be the first time and. I, I might be completely wrong that it is the first time, but let's just say it is the first time that somebody has come in and given a blanket sponsorship such as this. Mm -hmm. But why not be why not be excited about that and invite it because it helps every single player on that team out. And the, and even think, though it is coming from the city, yeah. but it's coming from yeah. the city, but it could come from anyone. It could come. From, I agree. Will come from Indiana and do that? I genuinely believe if it was like Pepsi, for example, that did it. I don't think it'd be as big as a deal as it is because it's the city doing it and they're they're basically putting sponsorship into their home team. If it were like any other brand, I don't even think this is a story. I think this is celebrated, but I think it becomes a thing because it's like, well, it's not my fault. I play in Indiana and you play in L.A., why should we not be able to go ahead and get sponsorships from our city, which is not, you know, going to have the same type of revenue as a bigger city will? I guarantee if this was not a city thing and this money did not come from the organization in which it came from and it came from like anywhere else, like a brand, I, I'm i like almost 99 percent sure this is not even a conversation. It's because of who it came from, not what it is. That's what I think. Yeah, I I agree with you. but also. It's a company just like anything else is, right? And yeah. we've seen commercials in our respective cities. Like for me, living in California, they have commercials with like Kim Kardashian or, you know, just, just you know, different actors or actresses yeah. or whatever saying like, come to California, come visit. Um, it's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. And so I love that they did it personally. I hope that other companies come in and do these types of sponsorships for every single team, whether it be the city or somebody else. Um, 
just come in and and spread this money around in women's basketball in the WNBA and give it to these players who deserve it. Well, I think we talked that one out. We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. We all need lawyers. We're good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we'll keep tabs on this. And I'm sure we'll probably honestly be talking about it again, because if there's an investigation, there's going to be right. some sort of, you know, fallout or whatever happens um, when that is, you know, determined. So we'll keep you up to date. We'll definitely keep you up to date on that one. Um, and one thing that, you know, speaking of Las Vegas, we just talked about it. Um, we have a really, really exciting interview coming up um, that both Ashley and I were so sad that we were not able to attend. It's the first interview that we've ever had, but it's actually the perfect time to introduce you to our amazing producer, Emma Ruby. And I don't know if she's going to pop in now. Emma? I know. Come on. Hey, Emma. Hey, Emma. Oh. She, is, she is the producer of We Need to Talk Now. And she comes to us from, she's a writer. She was a writer for Just Women's Sports. She worked on Women's Sports Social for ESPN. And now she is our producer. So she is the producer behind We Need to Talk Now. And our backup interviewer. Hey, girl. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. No. Thank absolutely. God for Emma. Thank God, Emma, the Mm -hmm. first time you pop out on the pod, it's to introduce your solo interview with Kate Martin. I mean, without giving too much away, because obviously we're going to roll the interview Mm -hmm. and play it for everybody. But like, what was just some of the things that you took away from that interview from Kate specifically, just as an individual, as a player? Like, give us a little something, something before we roll the tape. Definitely. I mean, I grew up in Iowa City, so like, I know of Iowa women's basketball, big fan. So like, it was kind of, it was fun um, getting to chat with her. And and I think she's just a great person, right? Like she's yes. an amazing human. She deserves this. Like, I, I don't, I hesitate in saying like, she's the underdog story of the WNBA this season, but it kind of feels like she is. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, it's so exciting to see her in a place where like, she's thriving, right? Like that's Absolutely. kind of one thing that I took away. Like she's thriving. And then, you know, we did this interview and then she made her debut in the WNBA and like had actually a pretty big game, um, yeah. made some pretty big plays, um, which was like super fun to watch. So yeah, no, I think just a great human, fun to interview and talk to and and get to hear her thoughts. So I actually, I remember when I, I was at the draft, um, this past draft, and I was a few rows behind Kate. And it was so funny to see her reaction when her name was called because as we know, she wasn't even there for that. She was literally yeah. just there to support Caitlin, to support some of her other friends that, you know, were invited to the draft and were on um, the board, if you will. And in her face when they called her, she was like, wait, that's not what I came for. So yeah. ever since then, it was just, you know, I just, I've been keeping my tabs on her, but I just love that that moment happened that way for her. It's just very, very funny. That was her introduction to the W essentially right. before and played her first game exactly. yeah and then she watching it's there with her and like they were like hyping her up it was it was so cute yeah yeah watching also her debut she i mean just came out she got a like a monster block like the reactions mm-hmm. that kia stokes had and kelsey plum like it was just so fun to watch her and i just feel like she is just kelsey aligned. Face. i know right i feel like she's just aligned to succeed and I'm really, really, really excited to watch your interview with her. So, well, speaking of, let's roll the tape then, shall yeah, we? Yeah, let's watch let's it. Let's do it. Roll it. Thank let's... you so much for taking the time. Um, it's great to have you here. Can you name your all time starting five in the WNBA? Oh, I'm going to go with Kelsey Plum. Oh, my. I, I would literally pick all of my teammates now. now. <laughs> um, I'll go with Kelsey Plum, um, Jackie Young. Oh man, this like I'm gonna choose all my teammates: Alicia Clark, Kia Stokes, and Asia Wilson. I'm taking those five all day. I mean, I think that's perfect, right? You gotta do it. You gotta do it. Um, if you could have dinner with three people, dead or alive, who would they be? Ooh, great question. Um, I would go. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, we're going to switch gears here a little bit. Mac Miller. Okay. And, and um, ooh, let's see. Who else? 
I'll go with President Obama. Okay. Cool. That's a solid lineup. Thank you. I really like it. What's your go-to pregame music or song? Yeah, I typically listen to chill music, Fleetwood Mac, typically. Um, yeah, like Edge of 17 by Stevie Nicks is my go-to song. I listen to it before every game. That's a great one. So then if you had a walkout song, would it be that or what would it be? Oh, no, it would probably be something different. Probably Make Me Proud by Drake. That would, yeah. I would get the crowd going more than Edge of 17. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who is the person you would trust the most with the aux cord? Oh, gosh. Chelsea is usually on aux, and she does a great job. Who wouldn't you trust? <laughs> oh, gosh. I feel like people would say me because I was listening to old school music today, and they didn't like it at all. So uh, I guess myself. <laughs> What's been your favorite main moment in the WNBA so far? Oh, gosh. Well, I think um, – Tuesday night, the home opener was amazing. It was really cool to be a part of, to watch everybody get their rings um, from last year. That was super special. And to get a front row seat to a, a fun game, that that was pretty awesome. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, kind of in that moment, like you're a part of a team that won rings, but you weren't, you know, really a part of that yet. Yeah. Um, hopefully yet, right? Right. So yeah. what, what was that feeling like when you were in that moment? Yeah, I, I felt really proud. Um, you know, I've gotten to know these girls over the last month or so. And, um, you know, it's really cool. Uh, I, I see the hard work that it takes to get there. And I know it's not easy at all. So the fact that they, you know, have been back to back champs is really cool. And um, it's a really special organization to be a part of. And, you know, obviously, that's the goal every year, um, game by game, uh, possession by possession. That's what, you know, it takes to, to get that. And so, uh, yeah, it was just, it was really cool. I, I felt really grateful to be a part of um, such a great team. You know, you've had quite the run in the last month. You went from the national championship to SNL to the WNBA draft, being drafted when you like weren't even there as like a invitee. And now yeah. you've made the roster. So how would you kind of sum all of that up? And what was kind of going through your mind as you were being drafted? Yeah. Gosh, I don't even think I can sum that up in just a few words. Um, it's been crazy. It's been a whirlwind, but I've felt very grateful to be in the position that I'm in. Sometimes I have to pinch myself uh, to make sure I'm not dreaming and that this is really my life. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't get the invite to the draft specifically, but um, I knew that I could hear my name be called that, that night. And um, luckily I did, and it was to the perfect team. Uh, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And so you know, it, it's it, that all was crazy, but you know, I am where my feet are now, and I'm enjoying every moment here with the Aces. Yeah, definitely. Do you feel like you've had a moment to breathe? Yeah, I, I think I'm finally starting to, you know, get my bearings. You know, I've been in Vegas for about a month now, and so it, it's it's been it's been nice getting my feet back under me. Definitely, definitely. Hopefully, it's a little bit of a drier summer than it would be in Iowa. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the heat's a little more bearable, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Um, you know, obviously, like, until you were told, there's no guarantees about making a roster. But was there ever a moment where you were in camp and you kind of felt like, okay, like, maybe this is going to happen? Yeah, I thought, uh, you know, from the beginning, um, I didn't know what to expect. But I knew that I was competing and I was working really hard and I was doing everything that was asked of me. And so, I wanted to give myself the best opportunity from from the jump and uh, do everything that I needed to do. I asked a lot of questions to the vets, uh, to the coaches, and um, you know I got good feedback right away. So um, I thought that it was a realistic shot of me making the team. But you also never know; um, it's a business, and you don't know what the team needs. You don't know what the coaching staff needs. And um, fortunate enough, you know I you know, I made the the spot and I, I know it's not easy at all. And many great rookies have gotten cut before. And uh, yeah, it's a cutthroat business, but I feel very fortunate to be in the position I am now. Definitely, definitely. What were kind of the feelings and emotions that you were going through as you were told that you made the roster? Yeah, I, I cried a little bit for sure. Uh, it just felt like relief in a sense, but also a hunger uh, because I, I knew it wasn't 
time to just relax. Like, oh, you made it. No, like I want to keep working. It gave me extra motivation. But really, uh, you know, my last four or five years at Iowa, I was super comfortable. I knew I had a spot. And while I still worked really hard there, you know, you get a sense of comfortability being around the same people, the same coaching staff for so long. So this felt like something I had really earned for myself for the first time in a really long time. And um, I was just really proud. I felt really great about that. Definitely. No. And I mean, yeah, congrats again. You spoke about, you know, being on the same team for four to five years. You went from a college team that has amazing chemistry, had amazing chemistry to now a WNBA team that also has a very similar amazing chemistry. How has that impacted your transition? Oh, it's it's been a very smooth transition because of that. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to be with any other team. Um, the Aces, they're, it's a winning culture here. Uh, they're great teammates and they don't just talk the talk, but they walk the walk. They are good teammates. Um, you know, they work really hard. They have the championship mentality. You know, they treat day one of training camp the same as you're going to treat practice 50 in the middle of the season. Um, and that's just really cool. That's where I want to be. That's my mindset as well. And so I couldn't be happier to be here. No, I love that. Um, and then I guess, you know, many of the vets coming into the season talked about the transition from college to WNBA and how hard it is. I mean, you know, how have you felt like that transition has been and, and have you seen a little bit of truth into what they said? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I think just if you know basketball, you know, there's levels to basketball. High school is different than college. College is different than professional. I mean, these are grown women who have been in the league for many, many years who have been working really, really hard to get where we are now and, you know, have the visibility that we're starting to get. Um, and, you know, I feel like, you know, I haven't really earned anything yet, but I am coming in at a great time and I'm super grateful for that. Um, but yeah, there's a transition. It's bigger, faster, stronger. Um, the pace is a lot different than college. Um, and the IQ, everybody's IQ is through the roof at this level. Uh, people know what they're doing. This is their job. And so, yeah, it's definitely been not a super easy transition, but my teammates have helped it become as smooth as possible for me. Definitely. And then I guess, you know, kind of come end of the season, you're looking back, what would you say would make have made this a successful rookie season and kind of what are you hoping to get out of this year? That's a great question. I think really um, just doing my role to the best of my ability every single day. Work. I don't want to have any regrets by the end of the season. I want to be the best teammate that I possibly can be. Um, and I want to be the best player that I possibly can be. I want to see, you know, growth in the weight room. I want to see growth on the court. And I want to see growth in my relationships, uh, you know, on the team as well. Um, that's really my main focus. And, uh, you know, the other opportunities will come if I, you know, conduct myself how I know I can, um, continue being a good person and work really hard, you know, good things will come my way. And so that's really what I want to see by the end of the season. Definitely. Definitely. I love that answer. I feel like that's a really good one. Not that you need my validation, but you did have some really good validation recently from Damian Lillard, who recently <laughs> chatted you out on Instagram on his story saying, is she going to be good for the team? For sure. For sure. <laughs> Uh, what does it mean to you like when you see a player like Damian Lillard shouting you out? Yeah, I really I don't I try to stay off social media as much as possible. But Alicia Clark actually sent me that. And uh, that was a jaw, a jaw dropper for sure. Um, I mean, I love Damian Lillard. Like I've watched him forever and he's a phenomenal player. So to see one of the greats be able to shout me out and say that and even know who I am. I mean, that's pretty crazy. That's another got to pinch myself to make sure I'm not dreaming moment. But um, yeah, that was that was very sweet. And it's cool to see NBA players, you know, lifting up the W and lifting up women's athletes. We need more of that. And we need more women lifting up women's sports, too. And so uh, to see, you know, NBA players shouting out uh, WNBA players, that's just super cool. Definitely. I mean, ballers, no ball, right? Um, so that is, yeah, I would say that's really awesome. Another kind of maybe probably pinch me moment was getting to go to the White House, right? Like that was one of the first things you did with the Aces. What was that like? Yeah, that was super cool. Obviously, I wasn't a part of the team last year, but we went straight from the White House to South Carolina for our preseason game. So we got to tag along and be a part of that. And really, it just showed that I want to be back there 
this upcoming year, you know, getting my own ring and getting recognized for that, you know, with the team, that would be pretty cool. So um, that was another, you know, moment where you felt really proud because uh, it shows all the hard work that they put in last year and it was paying off and, you know, get recognized by the president and vice president. That's one of the highest honors. And so just to be in that um, vicinity where many great people have been before, that was just a super cool opportunity. And I mean, I feel like, you know, Vegas is a great place to be. You're going to meet some really cool people and you're going to be a part of some really cool things. And so I'm never going to take that for granted. No, definitely. I mean, you're kind of teaming back up with some really cool people and Megan Gustafson. How has, how has that been? Yeah, it's been so nice to have her obviously have a familiar face coming into training camp. You don't know anyone or anything at all. And, um, but you know, that wasn't the case for me this year because Megan and I were teammates for a year at Iowa. And Megan's been through just about everything in the league, you know, from cuts to making teams to getting cut again to, you know, going overseas and whatnot. So she has a great perspective on professional basketball. She has a great perspective on life. And she's, you know, given me a lot of great advice and been a great um, listener to anything I have to say. And I really appreciate about that about her. So, um yeah, it's just been really nice to be able to have that Iowa connection and um, be able to go through this year with her. Definitely. And Pancake. And Pancake, yes. We love Pancake. I love her. Um, obviously, you know, Caitlin Clark is one of your best friends. It's mm -hmm. not really a secret. So what's it going to be like going up against her? In <laughs> yeah, uh, the only time we haven't been on the same team is like in scrimmages at Iowa. And uh, it's funny because – things definitely would get chippy between her and I. I'm not expecting that by any means, but I'm just saying, you know, it's it's weird being on the opposite team from her. And um, obviously, you know, I love her to death and I wish her nothing but the best. Um, but yeah, it'll be really cool just to see her again and to see her grow through the league. And, you know, I'm going to have her back. But, you know, obviously I am where my feet are right now. And, uh, you know, it's Aces versus everybody. I want to, I want to win and, you know, I want to beat the fever. So that's just, that is what it is. But yeah, Caitlin is my best friend and I love her very much. Um, and then I guess last one, you know, kind of, I know Kelsey Plum talked about it and the nickname Money Martin. I know it's not exactly a new nickname, yeah. but how did it come about with the Aces? Oh, well, it started at Iowa because our announcer, um, Jamie KV Lang, she, I, I guess I was on fire one game and she just started calling me Money Martin. And so that kind of spread turned into a shirt back in Iowa. And then uh, Coach Hammond asked me one time and she's like, what do they call you? Isn't it like Kate Money Martin or something? And so then it kind of ran from there. And now they call me Money Martin or Kmart or K Money, whatever. And it's uh, it's cool. You know, I, I like it, but I got to live up to the name. I got to knock down some shots to earn that. <laughs> They call you Kmart? Yeah. Kmart. <laughs> that's hilarious. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, well, that's awesome. And, you know, talking about Becky Hammond, last question, I promise. What's it kind of – I know you've talked about wanting to become a coach someday. So what's it like being able to kind of learn under her? Yeah, I feel like it speaks for itself. I mean, she's one of the best of all time. Um, and I – like I said, like whenever I said about being at the best place – for me, basketball wise, it doesn't mean just as a player, but, you know, as a future coach, getting to learn from her and the rest of the coaching staff, uh, it's been phenomenal. And just her IQ and, you know, everything she knows about the game, you know, I'm just trying to be a sponge and learn and soak up as much information as I possibly can, because uh, it, it's, it's a very unique opportunity that I have right now. And so, like I said before, I'm not going to take it for granted. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. And yeah, good thank luck. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. Alicia, Sorry. look, so easy to like Kate. She's so likable. And I know that when we talk about players, you know, sometimes you don't really care about their likability. You don't really care about who they are off the court, which is something that one of the reasons I got into journalism in the first place in this industry specifically was because I hated that that was such a narrative that you only really cared about the wins and the losses, the X and the O's, if you will. I always wanted to tell the stories of the people behind the stats. And I love that we're now in the day and age in sports where we see so much of the personalities and we're really falling in love with the people as we are the talent. 
And I, I don't know, Kate's really easy to root for. So great mm -hmm. job, Emma. Thank great you. Great job. No, <laughs> no, that's one of my favorite things too. And I think that's special about women's sports in the WNBA is we get to know these players on a deeper level. And it's something that I love about women's sports. Clapping Absolutely. it up for Emma, her first introduction on Face on the Cam. With an Appreciate interview. you both, the best yeah. people to work with, I swear. I wouldn't want to oh work with anybody else. So oh. thank you. Let's see so Oh, oh my gosh. No, I'm not even going to try because last time, <laughs> let's see if Emma, see, it didn't happen for her no. either. I don't how do you like have that. the magic camera? Magic. Can't tell you how. Just got it like that. <laughs> <laughs> All well, right. Well, it's well now to going, it is time for you to exit, <laughs> but just for everyone out there, now when you hear us say, Emma, are we right about that? This is Emma right here. This is what we yes. Face so. to the name. I'm, I'm Oz, the great and powerful. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. All right, so now we have a little segment we like to call We Love to See It, where we bring you something from each and every week that, per the name, we love to see. I'm not going to do the heart because Alicia gets mad that she doesn't have the magic. And I don't understand you know, it. I'm not going to do it. Um, it was a big weekend in the NWSL with some record-breaking performances from a number of teams and players. Um, the Orlando Pride tied the NWSL record for consecutive wins with their seventh in a row. They are also unbeaten in their last 10 games. And while Barbara Bandon has only been with the team for six of their matches, she's got six goals, which is roughly a goal in each match, uh, which has kept, no big deal, which has kept the Pride who finished last season in seventh just outside the playoffs atop the league in their through their first 10 games of the season but that's not all because then in the game between the washington spirit and angel city six six goals sorry this stat is crazy six goals were scored in the first 36 minutes of the match let me go ahead and repeat that because some people may think i'm lying all right six goals were scored in the first 36 minutes of the match, which is the fastest from kickoff that six goals have ever been scored in a match in NWSL history. Alicia, I played soccer for two years. I was seven and eight, maybe three, six through eight, maybe, I don't know, around elementary school. See, I don't even, I blocked it out. So I played soccer in New York and soccer season in New York is the worst because it's freezing. So the couple of, you know, weeks where it's nice and warm, it's enjoyable. And I remember, you know, putting on my little socks and my uniform and my mom would watch from the car because she wasn't about to stand outside. Listening. And I remember how hard I had to work for my first goal. I remember how hard my team had to work for a goal as a unit and a goal to beat the other team. I can't imagine scoring six of them in 36 minutes. That is insane. Like mind blowing insane. It is. And imagine calling that game too. Like you're literally just saying goal the whole time. Like that person oh. passed out. <laughs> yeah. That person definitely passed out. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> without a doubt. Congrats girls. Love it. I mean, listen, we do love to see it for sure. And another thing that we love to see is Lynn Williams. She became the all time scoring leader. Um, goal scorer across all NWSL competitions wow. with her 79th wow. you want to talk about goals 79th career goal um it was a beautiful header and it was um her ninth career headed in goal in first since 2021 um this breaks a tie with Sam Kerr who set the record in seven seasons in the NWSL and you know, Serena Williams was like, let me shout her out. And she said, congrats, cuz. <laughs> okay. You out. There you go. Listen, and when the goat says congrats, cuz, okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's on another that level. Right. That's on another level. Sure. But, you know, we talked earlier about the U.S. women's national team roster and how she wasn't on it. I mean, she is literally balling out. <laughs> um, and so for me, this definitely, I mean, She's one of the greatest players. I I really I really like Lynn Williams on many levels. Um, not only for what she does on the field, but also what she does off. She's, you know, also um, I don't think she has any more, but she had a digital show called Snacks that was really good that I used to watch all the time. Um, but besides that, she's just obviously a phenomenal player. Um, do you think that 
she was already one of the greatest or that this would cement her as one of the greatest of all time? I mean, girl, if you just got your 79th goal, you've kind of been in the conversation for a little while. <laughs> We're not talking seven. We're not talking 10. We're talking you just logged your 79th. I feel like that kind of was solidified by the time you hit, I don't know, 30, 40. <laughs> like, there's a Listen. number. But it's just like, all right, you're in the record books. You can chill now. <laughs> Absolutely. And so it's even more baffling to me that she's not on this roster. So I just want to put that out there. But I do want to read something that she said in her press conference after she set this record. And I just think that it's it's a really good quote that we just need for life in general. Ooh, okay. So she said, I'm just really proud of myself. Listen, you better be proud of yourself, Lynn Williams. Mm. I think that I have exceeded a lot of people's expectations I think that for a very long time, I have believed in myself in a lot of moments along the way. I've been told, no, you're not good enough. And I think that every single time I score a goal, every single time I'm put on the field, it's another moment for me to continue to believe in myself, like to continue to believe in myself, even when people say no. And that is just a life. That is a word for life right there. And it just shows you the type of player that she is. Um, yeah. pers- as we both said, yeah, you, you're one of the greats for sure. Um, in in many ways, I mean, you can see by her not being on the roster and maybe even people having this conversation of if she's a great or not is undervalued, you know, as a player, to be honest, but to still have this frame of mind and to be proud of yourself and to say, whenever people say no or undervalue me as a player or whatever, I'm going to say yes, right back at them and score these 79 goals. I think it's something that, you know, you can use in life. You can use as an athlete. You can use it anywhere. You just have to be proud of yourself and believe in who you are. I think that's great. I think sometimes you're so um, focused on like what's next and helping the team or just in life. If you're not even a professional athlete, I think sometimes you get so focused on accomplishing your goal that you never really just take a moment to just appreciate how far you've come and actually accomplishing that goal. And that's something I personally have been working on is I'm so always focused on like, what's next, what's next, what's next, that I've never been somebody who like really relishes in the moment of just like, wow, I I actually accomplished that or like, wow, I actually won this or I got this accolade. And I think it, there's nothing wrong with celebrating yourself. So I'm glad that she said that. So congratulations. That's great. Yeah. Congratulations to her. And I think in a world too, that often makes us want to feel small Yeah. and tell us that it's almost like arrogant to be proud of yourself. It's not. You should be yeah. proud of who you are. You're striving that. to get better every day and, and grow as a person. So be proud of you. Just like Lynn Williams, mm-hmm. she's proud of herself and she should be, she should be. So speaking of being proud, there are a lot of people in the WNBA that are balling right now. And I know that it's very, very early, but we're going to have a vibe check check right now. We're going to have a vibe check. Listen, (laughs) you didn't see my hand. I had it off camera, but I did the same thing. (laughs) Um, But this is a way too early pick. It was hard for me to pick because I'm just like, literally we're like weeks, like a week into the season, if not Mm -hmm. two weeks. I don't know, but we early in the season. and. who would be your pick for WNBA MVP? Listen, I may be biased here. I'm going to be biased. That's okay. You know, I'm born and raised in New York City. I'm going with the Liberty. I'm going with Brianna Stewart. My girl's hooping, balling, all of that. No surprise. Stewie would be my way too early prediction for MVP. But, I mean, 31 points against the Fever last Thursday, as well as 10 rebounds, four assists, three steals, two blocks. Um, Like, it's so easy for her. It's just like, I wake up and I do this. So, Stewie, you got my vote, girl. I know we're not voting yet, but if I I was, you got my vote, for sure. Yeah, I mean, Stewie is a great candidate. I personally, and I've been, you know, watching her for a while now, Um, She's somebody who is an amazing player. And I also think is a little bit of an underdog. If you can say that it's, she's not, but people just don't, you know, say her name as much as I think they should is what I'm saying is Alyssa Thomas with the Connecticut Sun. Listen, Alicia, she is averaging near a triple double through three games. I mean, nothing, just, you know, light work, light work. Um, And she was just selected right before we started this pod 
um, as the Eastern Conference Player of the Week. So she's definitely balling out. And last year she finished sec she finished second in the MVP voting. And so like she's she's coming to win it this season. So my early, it. early, early pick is Alyssa Thomas. I'm Listen, excited. As we as we said, we're only a week in. It's a very early conversation. We're right. gonna have some names in this week that may not be next week and so forth, but Make sure you guys are keeping it locked because we're going to be doing this throughout the season. And who knows, one of our picks will eventually come true. So there's well, we that. Also want to see, we want to see what your early, early, early picks are. So make sure comments. in that comment section below, drop that MVP. Let's have a conversation about it. Let us know. Um, and now we're going to let you guys know it is time for our favorite segment. And that is Connecting Changes Everything presented by AT&T. Alicia, this, this week we are talking about, I don't know, you might have heard of her. She goes by the name of Angel Reese. She's kind of new on the scene. Wouldn't be surprised if you heard of her, if you didn't. Um, she Little. recently added to her ever-growing resume because she doesn't have enough on her plate. Like she said, she likes to maximize her 24 hours, and she is doing just that yet again because she is the newest owner of DC Power Football Club, a USL Super League team. Uh, she now joins an ownership group that includes DC United of Major League Soccer, as well as community and business leaders from the DMV. As you know, she is from that area. Um, for those of you who don't know, the USL Super League, it's a new Division I women's soccer league that is set to begin play in August, so just a few months away. Um, and it's considered to be among the top divisions of soccer in the U.S., joining the MLS and WSL as D1 leagues. Um, in a statement, Reese spoke about this and she said, quote, she wants to help grow the women's, she wants to help grow women's sports and elevate female athletes across the board. We're taking over. I'm honored to be able to support Power FC and invest in women's soccer in the DMV community. Shout out to the DMV. Shout out to the princess of the DMV, Angel Reese herself. I mean, the girl's only been in the league for like, Two seconds. Oh, hot. And she's just like doing it all. I honestly love it. Listen, we've spoken about her last month. She did the draft, met Gala. She graduated. She partnered with Good American, Khloe Kardashian's brand. She's becoming a team owner. She's joining Patrick Mahomes and Serena Williams, Tom Brady, Kevin Durant, who all have their hands in various sports teams. Naomi Osaka, shout out to her, North Carolina Courage. I mean, girl, take a nap. Listen, I mean, when I talk about the amount of things that she's done, you know, you name some of them, but she graduated. She went to the Met Gala. She's Earth. owning a team now. She's playing well. You know, you could go down the line and I just love to see it. Um, I love that, you know, she is already investing back into women's sports with all of the sponsorships that she's getting. You know, she just had one with Good American. Mm -hmm. Um, she was, a, I, I want to say like the first tall model with good American, which shout out yeah, to, to all the tall first, women out there. It was from their first collection for, uh, women, I believe five, 10 and taller. Um, so they have, yeah. they have jeans and stuff that are for taller women, but this line specifically was created with tall women in mind. So, I mean, that's incredible. Um, yeah. I hope that. they have my yeah, tall too. Yeah. So makes sense. Yeah, I I hope they have my inseam. Like I, I really do. <laughs> I'm going to look it up after this. Cause I, I'll cop a pair of those, you know, if, if angels rep it them, you know what I'm saying? But Obviously my, much... my inseam's not as tall, long, but the jeans, I will say great quality. Okay. Um, I do have a set from them. I actually have a set from them. I have a skirt for them and I have a pair of leather pants for them. All great quality. So Chloe Kardashian did her thing. We'll give her credit. Listen, Chloe, if you got, you know, a 37 inch inseam that you want to, you know, get over here. Like that's, that's what I'm wearing 37 to 40 inch. So if you, <laughs> if you have that, um, send those my way. Um, but going back to Angel Reese, uh, her investing back into women's sports is huge. It's such a boss move. And I absolutely love 
you know, obviously she's making her own decisions, but it really seems like she has a great team around her to help her make these decisions as well. So I'm just really excited to see where her entire career goes. If she's already, you know, buying into teams um, and, and doing all of these things, like there, there's just no limit. I mean, she also met Meg the Stallion the other day. People are coming to her. Who came to her game? I mean, after that, you but she was twerking. And Lotto came to her game. Yeah, Lotto came. They asked Lotto. her why she came, and she said, Angel Reese, like, why else would I come? She didn't say that why else. That, but. And there was a video of her leaving on her private jet, and she said, I only came for Angel Reese. Now I'm out. Like, okay, flex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, I mean, that's that's a huge move. It's something that I really there's there are some players in the W that already have invested into teams as well. But I think it's going to be a trend that we're going to see so much more um, moving forward. So I just love that Angel Reese has done this and looking forward to seeing her, you know, club out there playing. So uh, really excited about that. Come on, Angel. You better do all the things. Hey, all the things. <laughs> well. You know, we have talked a lot about the W and we always will. But one thing we need to talk about is the NBA, Ashley. We are we're moving into the conference finals mm -hmm. and Pacers are facing the Celtics and the Timberwolves mm -hmm. are going to go up against the Dallas Mavericks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what's up now? What are we going to see? Who do you think we're going to see move forward from these conference finals? I think it's going to be Boston um, in the finals. I think the general consensus is going to be Boston unless the Pacers pull off some miraculous uh, series performance. I just don't see it happening. The Boston Celtics are just that good. Um, and I actually am torn between the Timberwolves, who I'm a big Anthony Edwards fan, love him, and the Mavs. Kyrie is my guy, always has been. But I'm leaning towards Mavs in seven. I think we're getting Mavs versus Celtics, Kyrie versus his former team, a team he did not have a good time with. And uh, it's going to be exciting to watch. That's my pick. Who you got? You know, Celtics for sure. Like, yeah. to me, that wasn't a question. Was not a question. <laughs> but I'm I'm going Timberwolves all the way. Ooh, I mean, for me, that, that heart, that grit, that we're coming for you, we're going to get it, that comeback That's that true. they had. Yeah. I'm sorry, what'd you say? Best defense in the NBA, so best, it's not a best crazy defense. Pick. Absolutely. And anyone who comes back from a deficit like the way that they did in that game, like I wouldn't count them out in any way, you know, because you already know you're going to scrap, fight, and get back up and, and ultimately win. So for me, it's that it's that heart, you know, it's that we want it. And, you know, the team, the team is great as well. Like it's not, I'm not discounting that, but I think in the playoffs, you know, they say that you're at zero zero, you know, when you start the the conference finals or or the finals. And um, to me, when you have that, you kind of have that fire inside of you. Like, I'm going to pick that any day of the week. Well, listen, we are going to see. Obviously, Alicia and I are on the same side when it comes to the East. But when it comes to the West Coast, we're going to see who is right. We'll be tracking that as we continue this podcast. But that does it for this episode of We Need to Talk Now, presented by AT&T. We want to remind you to follow us individually on our socials, but also follow the show. Like, subscribe, share with a friend, another friend who shared with another friend. Just pass it around to a couple people you know, highlighting women's sports all year long, highlighting women all year long, and we'll throw some other things in there. You never know what we have in store. Uh, so make sure you turn those notifications on so you don't miss a thing. And uh, we'll be back next week on We Need to Talk Now, presented by AT&T. Bye, guys. See you next week.